that last week we had the meeting with um, the sort of a quadripartite with the um, Dutch government, the French government, so Paris. So basically The Hague, Paris, Philipsburg, and Marigot had to do with the entire issue surrounding uh, the conflict at the Captain Oliver's Marina over at Oyster Pond. Um, the Profet, um, at the, at, towards the ending of the meeting, apologized for actions undertaken by them. It was based on a misunderstanding, they claim, on their part. Um, right now, up to yesterday, um, the Secretary General of Romy, um, Mr. Lewis Brown, was talking to his counterpart, um, Mr. Fleming, on the French side for them to draft um, a, a letter on the way forward as it pertains to the construction activities at the Captain Oliver's Marina. But the French have agreed to basically continue observing the status quo, which would basically entail that the jurisdiction over Captain Oliver's Marina and Oyster Pond remains on the uh, jurisdiction of the Dutch side because what you have is that <clears throat> the, the, the land border demarcation treaty, the negotiations for that have not even started yet. We have concluded the sea border demarcation um, negotiations and treaty. It was signed right here in the old government building last year, in the old administration building. Uh, it was signed. Um, but the land border demarcation treaty is not yet um, nowhere close to being in place because it, the negotiations have not yet started. And one of the issues surrounding that or involved in that is that the oyster pond area is under dispute, particularly on the part of the French, as they are claiming that they should own half of it. But we are not yet there. So you can't start acting as if you own half if there is no agreement on your ownership of half. Um, so in the course of this week, um, the owners and operators of the um, Captain Oliver's Marina um, will get um, a letter explaining the way forward and um, that the embargo at least that has been placed on the upgrading or the repairing of the facility would then be able to continue and business would be able to continue as well. Um, while I was away, I've taken note of comments um, again made, you know, there's a back and forth between uh, the Dutch and the St. Martin government as it pertains to the integrity chamber, who is right, who is wrong, who would come with a measure, who would not come with a measure, uh, motions of parliament and the likes. I'm sure that is a topic that uh, members of the media would like to discuss, but what I'm saying is on Sunday I'm traveling to Aruba and part of the discussions that I will be having in Aruba while I am there will entail a discussion with Minister Plasteric on the way forward with the integrity chamber. I don't want to go now into too much discussions again because it would create um, probably good headlines and, and something good to read and talk about. But I, I want to stress though that for this government, the issue of integrity is of paramount importance to us as well. But the integrity chamber as envisioned by the Dutch that is where the problem lies. So to say to St. Martin that St. Martin has not done anything since the agreement, since the protocol of 2015, is absolutely incorrect. Because St. Martin, back then, everyone can recall, the government, and by extension, parliament, did everything. Um, and I described it back then as, you know, the proverbial putting the gun in the room and allowing someone to blow their own heads off. But the Dutch government was involved, or the Dutch was involved, in the drafting of the integrity uh, chamber's legislation that was presented to parliament. It was presented to parliament. Parliament, um, with a majority vote, um, voted for the legislation, and it, it would have become law. But 
the ombudsman filed the case with courts and the courts and I'm saying I'm basically repeating what we have said for for to again now start back with the St. Martin government didn't do anything and they did not live up to the agreement and therefore now the Dutch government would do what they have to do is incorrect because the St. Martin government did do what they had to do and including but we live in, 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 in a country that is ruled by law so you can't tell us uh, we want you to do something and when we do it and it's in conflict with our constitution that you then say St. Martin didn't do anything. So where we are at now is yes we are reviewing uh, the steps forward and one of the things I think that when we include that in the whole mix we see now again the ombudsman has decided now they will start investigating the so-called the, the ZBOs, institutions such as the cadaster and, and, and things like that. So institutions that have a, a, an independent uh, character nature, but is executing uh, functions that actually belong to government or, or government is responsible. The dance floor is back. back. Friday, April 28, 2017, at Carnival Village. The ultimate dance party featuring Impact Band, Kai, formerly known as Kari Me, Jean Marc Ferdinand, Claudius Phillips, Farmer Nappy, and the Queen of Bacchanal, Destro. See you at the fifth year anniversary of Telcel Night of the Hitmakers. Partners, Telcel. This is an extra tight entertainment production. Just say I. GEBE has been faithfully serving the communities of St. Martin, powering your home and our economy. Come rain or shine, our qualified team of professionals are working hard 24 hours a day to provide you and your family with safe, reliable electricity and water. We use the latest technologies and test our products daily to maintain the highest international standards. Our friendly staff is always there to assist you whether in person, over the phone or online. We are committed to constantly improving our products and services, making them more efficient, effective and environmentally friendly to serve you better today and our next generation of clients tomorrow. GEBE, -E, powering a brighter future. Our friend Mega Wadi is here with tips to save you energy. One, turn your air code temperature up. Two, use a ceiling fan instead. Three, buy energy saving products. Save some green with NVGEBE. -E. Life is a journey full of connections. You're in safe hands even when life starts too soon. You don't have to miss a single beat. When a bad hair day makes you sad, just sharing can bring you joy and more to come. They take the plunge, turn fear into faith, while you capture those beautiful moments. In the game of life, it's family that counts. They'll be there even when you lose. We all have our moments of reflection and hope. And when you feel you're losing everything in life, we're there because there's more to come. When life starts too soon, you don't have to miss a single beat. We're here to connect you and share life. Tell so when you want more. The police has been busy, very busy, on many fronts, um, implementing improvements, as mentioned, in their plan of approach for the police force. In spite of the many challenges they have managed to book great improvements, 
for which I congratulate um, Chief Carl John and his team. However, we all know the island has been plagued by some very violent robberies recently. Um, with the situation reaching the level of uh, unacceptability. The population is worried and some feel unsafe. The feeling of um, security and feeling safe must be restored to our community. I have said at the beginning of my term that I would present my plan to combat these robberies this week. Some took it, as I was saying, that I'm making another plan to add to the many that already exist. There are reports made by the Council of Law Enforcement, the Progress Committee, the police themselves, and the Ministry, and others. And now it is in time to implement those plans. So what we have done, we have looked at all of those plans and their recommendations. We have spoken to almost all of the stakeholders involved. And um, I have asked the police to come up with a synopsis from all of those things as an immediate solution of how we can deal with that situation. And the most important factor from all of those plans would be um, the capacity of the police force. That is the red line through all of those um, things. They're, they're, they're not um, enough uh, police available to do all what has to be done. Um, also taking into consideration that many of the newly recruited officers of the past, past year, two years, um, are now in training. So at certain times they are not available to be um, on the road, but they have to undergo those training. Otherwise they, um, we too would be in violation of their um, of their rights to those trainings. So a plan has been put forward which would entail the recruitment of 20 new um, officers. And the 20 new officers, it would be split between recruits, new, new, new recruited people, because in the end, we don't wanna be standing here five years from now saying that we don't have our own uh, people in the force. And um, from what I understand from the police, it was not a matter of finding locals who were willing um, to go into the force. It was just that um, the, 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 there was no possibilities in hiring them because of all the other problems that we had. So we'll go over to hiring, hiring um, new recruits, which would also be immediately um, put into the training. Um, and we would be hiring um, uh, also experienced police officers. Um, these experienced police officers more than likely would have to be uh, recruited from abroad. However, uh, I have uh, spoken to the unions on this matter and the recruitment of police officers from abroad in no form or fashion would hamper the progress of any of the existing police officers um, within the line. So the, new, the newly recruited police officers would not be able um, to be placed or put in the positions by which they would block um, present officers from their career development. So that, that is the major part of it. Um, the supplementary parts of it are the, um, the camera project. The camera project that is ready to go, um, has been approved, has been paid for, uh, definitely phase one, but was stuck in the execution. I um, spoke to uh, the company that is um, supervising that, which is um, TLM, and I was assured that within two to three weeks, the phase one part of the camera project can start being implemented. So the camera project would um, be online. The priority areas would be those areas as indicated by um, the police. So the police was involved in the, in the planning and where the cameras would come would be the priority areas, the first set of cameras indicated by the police. The other area is the Justice Academy. We have a Justice Academy where we're supposed to be training um, 
uh, our local law enforcement officers, and a lot needed to be regulated there. I met with the board of the Justice Academy, and apart from that, also in the first part of with the recruiting of the police officers, with the, with the chief of police too, and um, the Justice of Academy, um, uh, which is running, which is functioning, right now the, the, you see um, the officers, the, what we call the buff pullers, who were working in the police force without being able to further their training. They are now training, and action, some of the, 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 the uh, controls that you see happening are those buff pullers in their, and I'm not allowed to call them buff pullers in the morning, they are um, assistant recruits or surveillance, right? They are, they are um, um, the ones in their practical phase who um, would be doing that. What would happen now, because there, there's, a, there's a good group of officers available there. So the scheduling of the of the training, when they are in the classroom training, when they are out practical, can can be um, coordinated with the new group that is coming in, and also with events. For instance, if there's a major event um, taking place, like for instance the upcoming um, regatta, for instance, you would not have um, uh, uh, 20 of your police officers sitting down in class doing a theoretical training because they're, they're mostly needed and on the road. So that coordination between all of the parties um, would go better. All across St. Martin are switching to a more rewarding experience. The Whip MasterCard Fun Miles credit card, better known as My Card. Earn one fun mile for every $2 spent, even abroad and online. This will quickly get you a ton of fun miles to redeem for travel, shopping, food, fuel, and much more. But there's more to My Card worldwide acceptance, an EMV chip for extra security, and 250 free fun miles with first use. Switch to my card today at WIB. Telcel Night of the Hitmakers. Telcel Night of the Hitmakers. Fifth year anniversary. The dance floor is back. back. Friday, April 28, 2017, at Carnival Village. The ultimate dance party featuring Impact Band. Kai, formerly known as Kari Me. Are you ready? Jean Marc Ferdinand, Claudius Phillips, Farmer Nappy, and the Queen of Bacchanal, Destro. See you at the fifth year anniversary of Telcel Night of the Hitmakers. Partners, Telcel. This is an extra tight entertainment production. Just say I. We conducted a number of meetings. The actuary, uh, Willis Tower Watson, together with the Ministry of VSA, we met with a number of stakeholders to present a preliminary version of an economic model for national health insurance. So this is the economic model which they use to create the um, basis for the national health insurance scheme from a financial uh, perspective. We met with a broad cross-section of the community, including senior citizens, groups, government, business, unions, and different higher councils. I would characterize the meetings as very open and positive. Many questions were posed. There were many challenges to some of the assumptions that were made. Um, it's clear a number of uh, assumptions need to be made in terms of data. As a country, unfortunately, we do not have the data that we would really like 
even, for example, what is our true population size is a, is a topic for discussion and obviously has an impact on what the financial model would be. So the actuary has taken all of those comments, all of those queries, all of those challenges and has returned and will refine and improve the model and subsequently return to the island to discuss again with stakeholders. Government is very much committed to universal health coverage, bringing accessible, affordable, quality health care to our people. We are also equally committed to getting it right. We want to make sure that it's financially sustainable, that it's stable, and also that it's economically feasible. If you underfinance the national health insurance scheme, that in the end will ultimately translate into an issue delivering the quality of care to our people. And if it's unfairly or let's say overfinanced, it ends up creating a financial burden for our country and problems for our economy. So we really are committed to getting what I would call a Goldilocks solution. Not too hard, not too soft, but just right. Another topic I'd like to speak about, um, yesterday in Council of Ministers, it was agreed that we would request legal advisors to explore the possibilities of filing a lawsuit against VAMED to stop them from halting the development of our new general hospital. Based on the urgent needs of the country to develop our healthcare system and build a much needed hospital that complies with international standards, our legal advisors will advise the Council of Ministers if there's a proper basis for a lawsuit against VOMED. The case of VOMED hampers the development of our healthcare system. A new hospital has a direct and substantial impact on the cost and therefore sustainability of our healthcare system, as well as obviously an impact on the quality of care and therefore a direct impact on the health of our population. And it's my belief that government should not allow our health care system or our developments to be held hostage due to the court case by a foreign multinational for financial gain. And I feel confident that the more we investigate prices regionally for other hospitals, the more convinced I am that the price of INSO is not too low and that it is competitive and reasonable. The country and the people and in particular also the staff of the St. Martin Medical Center, we need and deserve a new hospital. The hospital that we're currently operating in has long outlived its, um, its lifespan. I also recognize and appreciate that the staff, management, and specialists have been and continue to operate in a challenging environment. All three of my children were born in the medical center. I am a former chairman of the board of the medical center. And ironically now as Minister of VSA, I'm very much involved in the, the development of our healthcare system and with that the medical center. So I have a very special affinity for the medical center and I want the staff to know that I have, um, they have my full commitment and relentless effort to ensure that a new hospital is going to be built as soon as possible. Also recognizing though that a new hospital is only a building. Yesterday we had a very good meeting with representatives of the SMMC and together we've agreed that the hospital will begin the process of working towards a JCI accreditation. Now working towards a JCI accreditation is an international standard that many of the top hospitals internationally comply with. I think that this makes sense for the long term. Um, in particular, we're working with SEDV in our referral programs, trying to narrow down where we're sending our referrals. By bulking together our purchases, we believe that it's possible to negotiate better prices, and this is something we're working together with Aruba and Curacao on. It's been said that behind every door, possibility awaits. How much possibility depends on which door you open first.
Every day, we help our customers discover the possibilities in their lives. It all starts with a conversation. Scotiabank. Discover what's possible. Uh, to sort of give some in-depth uh, understanding as far as the regatta contribution is concerned. We've got rules. The law says that if you give subsidy, that after you've gotten subsidy, you have to give account of the subsidy you've received. December 19, 2016 is when the regatta submitted the accounting of the subsidy for uh, the previous year. That's why the advice was made up and came to the Council of Ministers yesterday for approval, and it was approved because with the accounting, they met the requirement on the law to receive subsidy. I know there have been a lot of discussion relative to the subsidy being paid to Regatta, a lot of complaints have been made because the, the subsidy was not being paid out. But the reason is we've got rules. And we have to live up to those rules. The rules are there for a reason. And receiving subsidy and not giving accounting for it, you can't expect that the Council of Ministers is going to approve subsidy again without that accounting. So that is the background and the reasoning behind why the subsidy was not approved previously. December 19th is when they provided the, the necessary backup and the necessary information that the law requires. And that's the reason why yesterday in the Council of Ministers, their subsidy has been approved.